Right. So, our dear Dr. Veda, he is going to speak about omega-3 fatty acid inflammation. Yes, some of you had inflammation questions. So, stay tuned for this. And, and, and angiogenesis. So, inflammation and angiogenesis, the nutrigenomic effect. Right? So, perhaps uh, doctor will want to also explain what exactly nutrigenomic means for those of us who are hearing this for the first time. Now, a little bit of uh, an intro of the background of our dear speaker today. Now, she's the head of uh, program for the Bachelor of Science, uh, Nutrition and Wellness and a senior lecturer uh, with the Faculty of Applied Sciences, UCSI, University of Kuala Lumpur. She also has a doctoral degree in the field of clinical nutrition. I remember uh, this subject in university, in clinical nutrition and disease as well, oh, you know, and application. Um, her main research expertise is on clinical nutrition, emphasizing a healthy eating and wellness, mainly among cancer patients and non-communicable chronic disease patients. She initiated several studies among secondary school students to promote healthy eating and lifestyle and healthy food choices at home and school canteen to prevent chronic disease in adulthood, how childhood nutrition can affect uh, adulthood diseases. Uh, she's also the recipient of several awards, including a gold medal for her research presentation in conjunction with National World Cancer Day celebration in 2012. And she's also committed to working to improve nutrition and physical wellness among underprivileged communities. Dr. Vedehi is the recipient of uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Grant from uh, Bank Rakyat for the last three years, yeah, consecutive years since 2019. So without further ado, my dear Dr. Vedehi, the floor, or the, shall I say the screen is yours. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you very um, much, Suresh. Uh, let right. me share my screen. Is it clear? I don't see anything yet, uh, Doctor. All right, one moment. Let's screen, screen. Okay, you are sharing screen, it says. All right, so I see your desktop, I think. <laughs> okay, cool. I see your omega-3 fatty acids, inflammation, and geogenesis. I see your slides already. All right, so good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to present, as you know, we uh, talk about omega-3 fatty acids. We will talk more about omega-3 fatty acids at the second half, but uh, we already learned what is, uh, we already hear what is angiogenesis. But I want to explain how this angiogenesis lead and link to diet and why we decide diet as a preventative approach to to promote anti-angiogenesis. So there are medical re revolutions happening around us and it's one that going to help us conquer some of the society most dread uh, conditions, including cancer. And the re re uh, revolution is called as angiogenesis. And it's based on the process that our body used to grow blood vessels. So why should we care about blood vessels? Well human body is literally packed with them about 60,000 miles worth in a typical adults. And, uh, and, and the end that, that would be like when you, when you pull the uh, capillaries, it would circle the earth twice, the small vessels. And, and these vessels, are the small blood vessels are called as capillary. We got about 19 billion of them in our body. And these are the vessels of life and as I will show you, they can also be the vessels of death. Now, the remarkable things is about blood vessels is they have the ability to adapt to whatever environment they're growing in. For example, in liver, uh, where they can form channels to detoxify the blood. Um, in lung, they, can, they line the air sacs for the gas exchange. In muscles, they clock through so that the muscles can contract without cutting off the circulations. And in nerve, they, uh, they cause a, uh, a, along the power line, keeping those nerves alive. And we, and we got, uh, and, and make sure we even can uh, move and then do our normal bodily functions. All right, looking at this, normally we get the uh, blood uh, vessels 
since we are in womb. And what that means is that adults words, uh, adult do not normally grow wood vessels. We do grow blood vessels, but in a few special circumstances. For example, in women, blood vessels grow every month to build the lining of the uterus during the pregnancies and uh, uh, until the pregnancy. And during the pregnancy, they form the placenta, which connect the mom and baby. And uh, after injury, for example, blood vessels actually have to grow under the scap in order to heal a wound. And this actually, what is look like, hundreds of blood vessels are growing towards the center of the wound. If you see here, oh, center of the wound, so that the body is able to regulate the amount of blood vessels uh, within the time given. All right. And it does this through the elaborations and elegance system, what we call as balance stimulator and inhibitor. Balance stimulator and inhibitor angiogenesis says that when we need a brief burst of blood vessels, the body can do it by releasing the stimulator by releasing the stimulator proteins and this protein called as angiogenic factor that act as a natural fertilizer and it stimulate new blood vessels to sprout. And when those excess vessels are no longer needed, the body prune them back to the baseline using the naturally occurring inhibitor of angiogenesis. You see that. Now there are other situations where we start beneath the best baseline here. And we need to grow more blood vessels just to get back to normal level. For example, uh, after injury, and uh, a body can do, uh, do that, <coughs> uh, uh, can, can uh, uh, grow back the blood vessels after injury so that they come back to the normal level. But what we know now is the number of diseases that are defect in the system where body can't prove back the extra blood vessels or can't grow enough new ones in the right place at the right time, basically. And this situation's angiogenesis is out of balance. And when angiogenesis is out of balance, it's result to a big spectrum of disease. And there are more than 70 major disease affecting more than a million of people worldwide. And that's all look on the surface to be a different form to each other, right? Different disease, a different form. But all actually share the same abnormal angiogenesis as their common denominator. And this will allow us <clears throat> to reconceptualize the way that we are actually looking at this disease. And today, as our focus on cancer, because angiogenesis is the hallmark of the cancer, and I mean it is every type of cancer. Basically, if you look at this picture, cancer does not start with blood supply. They start out as a small microscopic nest of, a, of cells. They can only grow to one half of cubic millimeter in size. That is about a tip of ball pen. And they can't get any larger because they don't have blood supply. So they don't have enough oxygen or nutrients. And in fact, they are probably from this microscopic cancer, which is harmless. So as our body, our body are very smart and our body have the ability to balance angiogenesis when it works properly like this and it's prevent blood vessels from feeding the cancer. And this turned out to be one of the most important defense mechanism against cancer. In fact, if you actually block the angiogenesis and prevent vessels from ever reaching cancer cell, tumor simply can't grow. But once, look at here, once the angiogenesis occur, cancer can grow exponentially. So this is actually how cancer goes from being harmless to a deadly cancer cell, mutated, and they gain the ability to release a lot of these angiogenic factors, the natural fertilizer that tips the balance in favor for the blood vessel invade the cancer once the vessels, uh, once the, uh, vessels are activated. So, so when, uh, once, uh, uh, at the point when the vessels 
invade the cancer, it can expand and it can invade even the local tissues. And in the same vessels, they are feeding the tumor, um, allow the cancer cell to exit into the circulation and metastasis. And unfortunately, this late stage cancer is one at which it's most likely to be diagnosed. Basically, most of the time in Malaysians, uh, even in other countries, most of them diagnose at the advanced stage. Those who are diagnosed at the early stage are those who come, uh, who seek for uh, medical advice at the, uh, with the, uh, after diagnosed with the early symptoms. But prevalence of late stage is very high in Malaysia. So at this stage, as how you visualize here, the cancer, the angiogenesis, already turn on and the cancer cell are growing like wild. The major part, what I said just now, I said revolutions. Right? The major part of angiogenesis revolution is the new approach to treat the cancer by cutting the blood supply to the cancer cells. And we call this anti-angiogenetic Therapy is completely different than the chemotherapy because it selectively aimed at the blood vessels that are feeding the cancers. And we can do this because these blood vessels are unlike normal healthy blood vessels. If you see here, uh, they are abnormal. They are poorly constructed because, and, and because of this, they are highly vulnerable to the treatment that target them. So for example, there are study that give the cancer patients anti-angiogenic uh, anti therapy. And uh, uh, if you see this picture, it's an experimental drug for a glycoma, which is a type of uh, uh, brain tumor. You can see that there are drastic change. Yes, there are that drastic change that occur when the tumor is stuffed, stuffed you know, means uh, that are anti-angiogenetic therapy. Let's look at this. In women with a breast cancer being treated with the anti-angiogenic drug called as uh, Avastin, which is a FDA approved. And you can see the halo of the blood flow disappear after the treatment. So now I have shown you two very different types of cancer and both responded to anti-angiogenic anti therapy. Now, obviously, antigenic therapy could be used for a wide range of cancer. In fact, the first spinal treatment for people as well as DOC is already available. If you see here, the survival data from eight, uh, yes, eight different types of cancer and the bar represents survival time, taken by the era where uh, only chemotherapy and surgery radiation is available. But starting in 2004, yes, when starting in 2004, when anti-angiogenic therapy first became available, you can see here 70 to 100 percent improvement in the survival for people with kidney, with multiple melanoma, uh, color, uh, uh, melanoma and also colorectal cancer and gastrointestinal stroma cancer, and that's impressive. But for other tumor cancer type, the improvement have been very modest. So. I have asked, we, we always ask ourselves, why haven't been able to do better? Why this anti-angiogenetic therapy is only work for certain cancers and other cancers are showing a modest effect. So we already, uh, uh, let's, let's we go back to the biology of angiogenesis. Okay, we, we have to think what could be the answer so that the cancer can be prevent, okay, can be prevent from the early stage, not after the late stage. Okay, so angiogenesis, as we uh, look just now, it can beat the cancer by its own game. Angiogenesis can lead to cancer, but by cutting the angiogenesis itself, it can be, uh, we can prevent the cancer. And or we can could the cancer cell could never be dangerous anymore, and this mechanism we can help uh, healthy people, and also we can help those who are beating cancer, even those who had recurrent from coming back. 
Yes. So when we look back the cause of cancer, we saw that the diet account from 30 to 35% of environmental factors. And now it is obvious thing to think, it's obvious thing to think about what we could do with our diet. So when we talk about diet, most of us, we think, okay, what to avoid? What to take up from our diet? What to strip out or take away? You see, diet, food is something that we enjoy. So why we need to remove them? Why not we, find, we select some diets to be added in our current diet? Right? So I, I always uh, believe that when we start to add a diet that is uh, beneficial, and in our case, naturally anti-angiogenic, it could boost the body defense system and beat back those blood system, uh, blood vessels, that feeding the cancer. In other way, we can say we eat to kill the cancer. So just now we heard a lot from uh, Prof. Merna about the plant-based food. If we just browse through, there are a lot of information in the internet talking about the uh, best anti-inflammatory food, uh, 20 cancer fighting food, anti-angiogenesis food, and so on. And we are, and, and I believe most of us know about this. How about fat? Oh, the first impressions when we talk about fats does come across our mind, right? Right or not? Burger, uh, uh, processed food, and so on. But, that, but is it that? And then some, some people always have this concept. Oh, fat are bad for us. Are they really bad for us? You know what? Good fat come mainly from vegetables, nuts and seeds. And good fat includes monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fat. Uh, bad one include the industrial trans fat. When we talk about saturated fat, it's somewhere in the middle. Oh, so good fat come from the plant base. But plant, fat, uh, plant fats are loaded with cholesterol. People still asking me, you know, plant is loaded of cholesterol. Please take note, plant fats like nuts, seed, oil, and avocado do not contain cholesterol. Most of the cholesterol found in animals. But yes, yes, uh, plants do contain cholesterol, but they have their own version of cholesterol. We call it as plant sterol. And it's actually helped us to lower our cholesterol level. So now, okay, now, okay, we are clear about plant uh, fat, so we are there. Then we say, okay, well, then animal fat are bad for us. Not exactly. Let's think about ghee, a uh, clarified butter. It actually can reduce, studies found that it can reduce risk of heart disease. It support digestions and even it prevent weight gain. There are, okay, not, not the cheap ghee, it's a pure ghee. Animal-based fat like gelatin and collagen, which are found in the animal food, uh, especially in the bone broth, and it can support the bone and joints. It reduces uh, uh, osteo, uh, uh, osteoarthritis pain, reduce the sign of aging, and even uh, it is found um, assisting with our digestions. Okay, besides this, what else? Yeah, fish, particularly salmon, sardines. Okay, they are low in saturated fat. And they are extremely high in omega-3 fatty acid. So we're going to focus on omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And they actually well known to uh, nourish our nervous system. So omega-3 is actually way more important than we thought, actually. Let's look at the items. So we have Three types, a uh, few types of omega-3. We have plant-based and animal-based. Yeah, plant-based is, we call this as ALA. Yeah, yeah, but it is not comparable to DHA and a, uh, EPA. So if you see, the highest content of omega-3 is in uh, fish. So if we ask 
how how often do you eat fish to get omega 3 omega 3 particularly okay if you eat fish two times a week you already supply your body with sufficient omega 3 for the week then we have selfish and other meats let's look at the plant based omega 3 so uh, when we are coming, uh, when we in line from uh, from the previous presentations, which is a plant based food, so which food are high in omega three? So like chia seed, which is a table tablespoon can provide sixty percent of your daily need, and a tablespoon uh, of flax seed can provide thirty nine percent of your daily intake, and him is can provide twenty five percent of your daily intake. So this. Uh, beside the nuts and seeds, even we can get omega-3 from legumes and vegetables. So just now we have questions about soybean. Soybean also a form of rich, uh, since it's a bean, so it's have rich omega-3, followed by tofu, broccoli, spinach, cauliflower, and sprouts. All right, come back now. Why omega-3? What is the anti-cancer mechanism of omega-3? So basically, we have two ways. They, they, uh, they, uh, there are a lot of evidence showing that omega 3s can help stop inflammations. Fatty acids such as EPA and DHA have been shown to reduce the uh, risk and not only heart disease but also cancer. So, people who have higher intake of omega 3, uh, higher intake of omega 3 are less likely to get cancer in addition to heart disease or other illness and health conditions. Studies found omega-3 can lower blood pressure, lower risk of stroke, reduce the plague in the arteries and more. And when it's come to cancer, expect, uh, experts suspect that omega-3 help to stop chronic inflammations and angiogenesis that can increase your risk for cancer. So basically, Omega-3 intake is usually anti-angiogenetic. It can improve. Okay, let's talk in this way. We keep on emphasize on omega-3, right? So what is omega-6? Why I'm not emphasizing omega-6? So before I go further, let me emphasize that I'm not nothing to say you can't take omega-6, but I say let's make it balance between omega-6 and omega-3. Okay, so previously, yes, the ratio between omega-6 and omega-3 was a bit balanced, which is uh, we gain, uh, it's about a 1 to 1 or a one, a 3 to 1 ratio between omega-6 and omega-3. But these days, it's at least 20 to 1 ratios and as high as 100 to 1 ratio of omega-6 fat to omega-3. And this is horrible imbalance. And there are so many health issues for your body as well as your brain. So that's why my concern here, I said, we take omega-3 in order to improve the omega-6 to omega-3 balance. <clears throat> and indirectly, we reduce the inflammatory signals, reduce the inflammation, ex inflammations and exercise and anti angiogenic effect. All right, let's look at the evidence, what they found. Okay, the recent study, they found that when they take from the uh, stem cells, from the adipose cells, when they take the adipose-derived stem cells, this is from the human cells, yeah? And they treat this adipose-derived stem cells because these stem cells are highly vulnerable with various types of omega-3 fatty acids, including MA, EDA, OA, EPA, DHA, that's we always heard about it, right? ALNA, linic acid, and also CLA. They found particularly DHA enhanced angiobiotic 1 mRNA level by fourfold, decrease the cumulative sprout length, means the, 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 the distance how the blood capillary grow in the adipose tissue by two, twofold, reduce the number of sprout, means how many branches, that is uh, the blood capillaries, which is uh, indicating uh, angiogenesis, by twofold, and it's increased the excretions of IL-8 by 70%. Impressive, right? So that is what they have found, the effect of 
omega-3 on angiogenesis. All right, <clears throat> talking a lot about that, let's come to another part of our topic today. It is nutrigenetic and uh, nutrigenomic. I'm focusing on nutrigenomic. Okay, what is nutrigenetic, first of all? This is your gene affect how your body respond to food. To do that, you have to do the whole genome studies and then you study the association. But now we are focusing more on nutrigenomic. It is what you eat affects how your genes behave. So what's the concept under this? Is the manipulations of the dietary component for human benefits, particularly for cancer prevention and treatment. So how they do that? They will analyze our genetic makeup to inform dietary recommendations that met our personal nutrition and health need and help prevent nutrition-related chronic diseases. Does it sound very complicated? Means they see how our gen gene are make up and they see this kind of gene need what kind of uh, diet or this kind of genes prone to what kind of diseases. So once we can predict that, we can change our diet accordingly based on the evidence and try to prevent the disease. And this is mainly related with nutrition component. So this can lead to a customized diet and exercise plans based on the individual genetic. And this may be next frontier for the nutrition counseling. So nutrition counseling currently, we see what is the problem with the current diet intake and so on. And this still at an infancy, uh, infancy level. So, but a lot of evidence are coming out so that we can see there might be a new approach in our nutrition later. All right, how omega-3 affect our gene and promote anti-angiogenic anti effect? Okay, all this word will be a bit new. So this is how the nutrigenomic works. So these are the receptors that related with our genes. So particularly, omega-3 are able to inhibit vascular and endothelial growth factors. This is a signal protein that produced by many cells that stimulate the formation of blood vessels. It's also inhibit, basically it's inhibit all this, uh, all this uh, culprits, uh, we call that. So it's inhibit platelet-derived growth factors. This is a protein that need for a blood vessel formation, the growth of blood vessels from already existing blood vessel tissue, which is also it's a promoter of mitogenesis. It also uh, inhibit the platelet-derived endothelial cell growth factors, which is, we see this growth factor particularly in the lining of the epithelial cells of ovarian endometriumus. And it's, it inhibit the cyclooxygenase too. See, we always see this in many journals, right? Which is this, uh, prot uh, this uh, uh, particles induce angiogenesis by stimulating angiogenic growth factors while inhibiting apo apoptosis in a cancer cell line. So we, when we stop this, when we can uh, reduce the expressions of this gene, it can stop all these mechanisms that lead to cancer uh, metastasis or the progression of cancer. We also can stop the prostaglandins, which is the product of COX-2. Uh, COX it also inhibit the nitric oxide, which is a, a partic uh, that needed for vascular homostasis or vasodilations in the cancer cells. It's uh, block the nuclear factor kappa beta, quite, uh, quite, free, uh, quite common, right? We look at this. This is a cytokine production. Uh, this NFKB is needed, any, any, uh, NFK beta needed for cytokine productions and cell survival of the cancer cells. So once we stop this, it can prevent the cancer cell from progress. It's also block the uh, affecting the matrix meta uh, matrix uh, matrix meta proteinase and beta catechin, and they found this uh, element is needed for uh, it's highly associated with the survival of the cancer patients. So when it stopped, it's increased the survival. So this is the current findings that I have found that omega three affecting anti uh, uh, promoted uh, um, no omega three. Uh, have an anti-angiogenic effect through the gene and we call it genomic, okay? All right, so 
before I end, maybe I end very early because I have some other things that verbally I want to share and I see a lot of questions there. So before we end here, there are a say here, right? Uh, that discover consists of seeing what everyone has seen and thinking what is no one has thought. So I believe I can, I have convinced you that we can stop this angiogenesis, not at the late stage, not only for the cancer management, but we can stop this angiogenesis at the early stage by preventing the angiogenesis with the good actions or protective actions of nutrients that are available around us. And here particularly, I'm trying to emphasize that not all fat are bad, but there are also some fats are good, which is, which is we have to take into account without eliminating them from our diet. All right, there might be some questions about when we talk about omega-3 and omega-6. That's always a question between omega-3 and omega-6. Okay, uh, is that any consequences? when you eat omega-3 in excess. And if you browse through, there are some studies find there are associations of high omega-3 consumptions with cancer. Uh, how come become like this, right? We are keep on saying, okay, omega-3 is good and how it can lead to cancer. Yeah, this, we have to emphasize here, the consequences of the toxicity. So when the questions arise, at what level of polyunsaturated, especially omega-3 fat intake should be balanced, achieved? Should we take high or low? Is the, my answer would be balanced. And the reference point for you to balance is your omega-6. So make sure it's balanced to the omega-6 rather than you make it imbalanced. So if toxicity or uh, excess intake of uh, 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 omega-3 lead to many consequences and uh, that means the it is important to achieve balance at low intake of both of this omega-3 and omega-6 no need to achieve balance at the higher intake but achieve the balance at the um, lower intake all right so what's the problem with the uh, uh, what's the problem with the current omega-6 currently okay current omega-6 uh, what happened? It's a, it's a, the way the type of food that we are taking is based on the type of food they are taking. So, like animal proteins, like chicken, egg, pork, red meat, they are also high in omega six fat. But I didn't say uh, we can't say that they are horrible food. The this become horrible food because of the horrible diet these animals are fed. Okay, these animals are given soy and corn because they are cheap food and they can fatten the animal quickly. So these animals are not free range. They are not pasturally raised. They are not eating uh, insects or grass like how nature had designed to them. So this causes even higher imbalance in the omega-6 fat and thus more inflammations and health problems arise. So as the says goes, you are what you eat, but you also what the animal at, as since, well, you are also uh, eating it, you know. So, am I telling that you have to eat more omega-3? As I mentioned just now, balance it, okay? Balance it. First of all, we have to identify what is our current omega-6 intake, and we consume a lot of omega-3 just to counterbalance the high omega-6. So basically the best source of omega-3 is from fish, but sometimes you will have the health concerns that uh, this fish are exposed to heavy metals and uh, uh, polluted water and so on. So try our best to get a, a healthy food, not a cheap food. All right, with that, thank you very much. I'm okay, so you're done, uh, Dr. Vidahi. We are, yeah. we are ahead of time, which is okay. <laughs> Just now we were behind. <laughs> okay, great. So we have a few questions here. Uh, I also will ask you a few questions. 
Interestingly enough. Um, right, I don't see you right now, Doctor. You're still sharing, is it? Oh, okay. So there's a question. Okay, I've got questions in the Q&A. I've got questions me. in the chat box as well. Cool. So let me just... Okay, great. Okay, so first question is... Uh, one of our... I think I'm going to start giving an award for most participative participant, which is Janice. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Janice. Okay, you're looking at me. Uh, so she says... Where to go for nutrigenetics test if there is a test? Is there such a test? And and get nutrition counseling after test results. So is there yeah, first of all a nutrigenetics test? Yeah, as I said, nutrigenetic uh, is is a, nut a nutrigenetic approach for a counts uh, dietary counseling is still at infancy. So we are we are we are gathering evidences so okay. that we can give you a spectrum of food. Currently, it is very focused on a specific nutrients like uh, omega-3 and then some other nutrients like uh, vitamin Ds and so on. But we are, there, is, there is a lot of other studies are needed to explain the whole diet. But how to do that? How they suggest uh, nowadays? Uh, we have to go to do our whole genomes, uh, uh, genomes uh, studies to see how our gene and then we see this kind of our gene is prone to what kind of diseases. Let's say we have our gene shows that we are high risk for cardiovascular diseases. So our, we will modulate our diet towards cardiovascular protective. So we will emphasize more on the nutrients that protect it towards cardiovascular diseases. Again, I'm telling you, we only can do for particular nutrients in this case because evidence are still limited. I see. Okay, so where, where if somebody wants to do this genome test, how do we do this? Where can we do this? Uh, we can do can in a genetic lab. lab. Uh, yes, we can do in a genetic lab, but uh, we are still uh, outsourcing it to uh, other other uh, countries. Uh, yes, so because uh, if somebody were to go to a path lab or a Gribbles or a good no no good no clinic no. and ask for not, not in path no. lab, that are biochemistry labs and uh, there are right. pathology labs. We need a genetic lab. We have genetic lab, but all most of the genetic lab are research lab, not a uh, uh, conventionally uh, available for uh, uh, for a uh, uh, like a blood test or so on, you see. So, so we can't really find out. Is it? Uh, yeah, we, we we can go for this research lab and then we do that. It's not like uh, how you walk into a pet lab. Uh, not like that. So, so any research labs that you know? Uh, we have most of the university genetic labs. Oh, okay. So I suppose so. Can the common man go into a university lab and say, "I want to do a genetic test." You have to find those who are doing that studies because to run a genetic test also, right? We have to get your uh, DNA, extract your DNA and RNA and then run the whole genomes and so on. So, uh, yeah, if, if uh, we can go for the uh, genetic lab is available in most of the university, we have to contact them and then we can offer ourselves to get know our gene readings. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's another one from Ivy Theo. Is Sacha Inchi oil a good source of omega-3? Sacha Inchi. Sacha Inchi oil. Okay, I, I, I believe there are a lot of products out there. Okay. Uh, yeah, Sacha Inchi oil always uh, talk about the omega-3 um, uh, oil, uh, omega-3 as a uh, rich in omega-3. Um, it's not only Sacha Inchi oil. There are many other oils. What I try to tell you here, we have many oils. I'm telling you, okay, these are the oils, the superfood of omega-3. So if you ask me, doctor, which one is the best? There is no such thing. All these are best. All these are find out as a superfood. So which to choose is based on your preference. Mm -hmm. Because no need to choose something that you don't like, then you won't eat it or you won't continue to eat it. So choose something from the list that you prefer to eat so that you can sustainably eat that, uh, uh, take that food and then you can, uh, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, feel the benefit of the food. Okay, so, but Sacha Inchi does, does have a good source, right? I mean, yes, it's one it of the oils. Have three, it have omega-6, it has omega-9, it mm. do have, it is also rich in uh, antioxidants, uh, and uh, the pure virgin Sacha Inch also consider good. And remember, this oil, you can't use for cooking or uh, to heat up. Okay, you have to use it as a uh, dressing. Uh, so uh, that's the best way to use this oil. When you 
when you use in cooking or uh, you expose them under heat, so it will be oxidized. So either it won't give you any effects or it can lead to harmful effects. So use all this as a dressing. Okay, all right. So just like uh, olive oil, you don't really right. deep fry, you can... Yeah, no need deep fry, so you just use palm oil. <laughs> but use as dressing, yes? Yes, use as yes. dressing. Okay, good. So there's a... Uh, so I've got some people putting questions in the chat box and Q&A. So guys, please put your questions in Q&A so we, we don't miss any questions. Sometimes okay. the chat Janice, goes missing. Okay, so Janice, Janice to, has another question. Yes, how to check omega-3 uh, How to check six level in the body. Six level in the body. Type yes. of food that you are eating. Okay, you have to look at the type of food that you are eating to see which is balanced here. You are not, you no need to count for it. You just have to look back what are the type of food that high in uh, omega-6 and what are the type of food high in omega-3. And then we uh, we try to balance between these two types of food. Okay. So... If you, are... if you eat triple time of omega-6, it's still okay. Don't like eat 10 times of omega-6 uh, based on the food items. I see. Okay. So... Generally, you would say food items which are high in six would be meat-based products, animal-based yes, meat products. Yes, meat-based product that is uh, commercially available. Okay. Uh, that commercially so, okay. available like uh, in a, uh, in a market and so on. If possible, like we take uh, ayam kampung, you know, uh, telur kampung, it's much better because it is low in omega-6. It's high in omega uh, Lower than the commercial chicken. Yes. It's uh, okay. So it's higher compared to the other chickens. But um, fish, of course, is the better alternative if you're yes. talking about animal-based products, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And uh, most most uh, foods which will have higher omega three will be, of course, plant. Yes. Plant-based foods. Most of plant-based. Right. Foods so plant-based foods ratio is more of a one to one. Yeah. Mm, yes. Correct. Okay. Now, the question here is uh, from Kim. Can circle DNA cater for genetic tests? Can? Okay, circle DNA. Uh, circle DNA. Circle, Are you what, familiar with this? What, what is that? Okay. So, probably is a method. I don't know. So, Kim, we are not sure. Hmm. <laughs> what is circle DNA? Maybe it's a methodology. I'm not I sure. For the, is, it, is it a company? Circle DNA. And circle get DNA cattle for genetic tests. Is it a company? I think uh, he, he's talking about company or about the kids. Uh, so maybe uh, Kim, you can just share in the chat box what you mean. Um, genetic. Uh, I, I think uh, he's talking uh, about Jessica the, says good info, the, the kid and so on. Lah, whether uh, if the kid is tested, uh, th uh, is a uh, is a uh, design to test your genetic. Ah, uh, yeah, it's definitely. Please look at the uh, the products informations. How the products works. <clears throat> well, um, I can't remember what test I did, but I did a saliva test for my daughter, which was a mm -hmm. DNA test, which will tell me more or less her predisposition to particular illnesses. So I can't remember. Unfortunately, I'm gonna ask my wife. Uh, but there are some tests out there, guys. You can go and check out whether, you know, these are tests available. So I went to a particular show and there was this person taking this uh, saliva test and we sent it to Singapore. You, uh, 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 tools used were from Italy. Uh, methodology was from US, a oh, long story. But we got it after six weeks and then we got an idea of what were the different uh, predispositions she had, you know, to particular illnesses and what all the other stuff like, that comes with the full report. Anyway. So that's, uh, that. there are these kind of tests, we need to go and Google and find them out. Now there's another one here, is DNA, DNA test is the same as genetic test, is, is, Actually, that, is that right? Genetic test and DNA test, uh, uh, genetic test also known as gene uh, DNA test. When uh, DNA test, we see the sequence, uh, the structure of the DNA. But uh, genetic test, we can see the changes, we can do uh, more into the RNA analysis. We can see how the gene are expressed. And then, um, uh, and usually genetic tests, we use like a biochemical analysis to see some protein outputs like that. So genetic test is more in detail. When we go for DNA test, it's more on the structural analysis. 
And okay. uh, when we talk about structural analysis, we can see is there any mutations happens and so on. Uh, there we can through DNA test. Okay, so we have people are very interested in finding out DNA. Eh? But yeah, guys, remember right. DNA so affects data. cancer. <laughs> DNA and cancer, five to ten percent only, right, doctor? Yeah. The, yeah, the connection. You know, you are 30, 35 percent is not. It's just not, diet. Yeah, right yeah. Yeah. Nutrigenetic, although it's a new approach, but one thing that you have to know is a small, it's just a part of uh, cancer prevention. There are larger part, another part, like environment, your lifestyles, your current dietary intake patterns. Okay, it's not only the nutrients, but the patterns that you are taking. So that is covering a bigger, large part. So why, why is still people emphasizing the nutrigenetic? We say at least we can cater the smaller part, you know? At least we can reduce the percentage or the prevalence, the incidence, and so on. All right. So, okay, uh, we have, uh, let me see, any other question here pertaining to the omega 3s and all? There is one question here on the balance, how much, but you're saying in terms of your intake, right? Yes, yes. So, I want, I want to add on to that question. And uh, I think it's important also, just like how people have misconceptions for oil. You know, you've got the moment they hear saturated oil, they find all saturated oil is bad. So coconut oil is 90% saturated, but it's medium chain fatty acid. Mm. So, you know, it's different from long chain fatty acid. So now that is one side. Now, the other side is maybe I want doctor for you to share with all of us here. Um, are all omega-6 the same or not? Because as far as uh, we know, nuts are healthy. Nuts have allergic acid, which is also anti angiogenesis I uh, also promotes anti angiogenesis. So, but nuts have a very high ratio of omega six compared to omega three. Like, for example, almonds. You're talking about thousand nine hundred to thousand to one, right? So maybe you just share with us so that people don't just see omega six, omega three, omega six, omega three, but understand that it's okay to take certain foods which have also high in omega six. If not, some people go Google, you know, omega six foods, and then oh, nuts I cannot take. So maybe you want to share some information on that. Okay, one, one thing, the beneficial, the, the food that high in omega-6, the good food, we call it as good food, also contain other omegas. Okay, it's also contain 3, 9, 7, and so on. So, they are, they are essential fat, basically. So, we are the one that control omega-6 consumptions. Okay, as I said just now, why we are emphasizing on omega-3? Because omega-6... The, the harmful type of omega-6 consumption is very high. So when you choose a healthy type of omega-6, actually you are reducing the harmful type of omega-6. So it's okay to take it. Okay, but let's we see the pattern. How many of us taking nuts every day? How many of us are taking this good calls, good omega-6 every day? No, right? So the consumptions, the amount of consumption is lower and compared to the uh, harmful part like, like uh, uh, meat, red meat and so on. So taking that is encourageable, definitely. One, one, the only concept I'm telling here, why we are emphasizing omega-3, just to balance the harmful part of omega-6. Because we can't control that. It is there in our environment. Okay, we can't go purposely go for kampung and find a kampung chicken or uh, the one that raised in the kandang and so on, right? Uh, so it's a bit difficult. So to uh, to counterbalance that, we emphasize on omega three only that. Okay, all right. So apart, let's say uh, the person is a vegetarian, mm. so you can forget about fish. Mm. <laughs> then, uh, so okay, what is your alternative? The fish. Uh, so we are completely like uh, dependent on ALA and so on, right? So to counter the amount, we have to we have to emphasize on variety. So when we take variety type of vegetables, so we know three, three servings of vegetable per day, so it's equivalent to three scoops of vegetables. So try not to eat the same vegetables every day, try to mix it up, okay, like a sayur champo and so on, right? That's, that's the concept, we try to mix different type of vegetables. You might ask, doctor, if I eat uh, bayam, sawi, kangkong, okay, right? And okay lah, but not that okay because all are green. Let's make it a bit colorful. Okay, okay. so bayam, carrot, or something else like a, okay, a, a tomato, you know, the more the color that you add in your 
uh, vegetable intake, actually the more variety or spectrums of nutrients that you're getting. So that will, that will complement the uh, uh, type of omega or type of uh, proteins, amino acids that we get from the plants. Okay. Any, any particular food you want to uh, sort of highlight? For example, like flaxseed? Is ah, yes. So, yeah. The flax seeds. You see, I tried. I tried. Chia seed. Ah, I tried. Oh, really cannot. You know, you can't. When you put, usually people put in water, you know, I tell, I, I admit this. Okay. When you put in the water, by the time two, two gulps and third gulps, you feel like can't, cannot. Many people are giving that. So, but how to take that? Why not you add that in your cookings, in your vegetables? Once you stir fry your vegetables, add flax seeds in that. Okay, I use that uh, for my cooking, bakings, and also for smoothies. Okay, uh, you can mix with your uh, honey so that you can just swallow it <laughs> for okay. those who really cannot take it. Mm -hmm. Some are really can take it and they mix with water. They drink it every day and uh, they have reported that they can see a significant change, especially for the weight loss and so on. Okay. So I'll take one more question here. It's about uh, why why exactly is omega-6 harmful? Uh, because of the process. As I said just now, it's not because of chicken meat or red meat. It's because of how they are being produced. How they are being produced. Even you the can... Omega-6 Yes. It's become harmful because uh, of so how the, they... Or how they produce so the question the question here sorry doctor is omega-3 omega-6 omega c uh, or is omega-3 more recommended so you're saying you want to balance the three and six so yes. why is omega-6 so that means the molecule itself why is it harmful? molecule itself oh, okay you know? molecule itself harmful okay. because it's can it's omega, six, yeah. uh, omega six is easily oxidized is Oh, okay. Yeah, easily oxidized, okay. so it can lead to harmful. So the more oxidized things you consume, the more harmful for your body. Yeah. So I think to add also is it also induces inflammation. Yes. Yes, definitely. Right. So omega six. So omega six increases is, uh, inflammation. Yes, oxidation is uh, one of the final steps to lead to inflammations, angiogenesis, and so on. Correct. So okay, wonderful.